Um, the Direct Action Network is kind of uh, an affiliation of a bunch of different organizations up and down the West Coast um, and who are coming together to try and work on direct action. So what role did Dan play during the WTO protests? Um, well, Dan was actually the organization that called for the morning action that started at 7 a.m. to actually shut down the WTO. And they were the main group that was actually calling for the shutdown. Other groups were, you know, working on the march that started at noon and um, doing other kinds of actions, like uh, the ring around the exhibition hall the night before, um, some symbolic actions like that. But Dan was actually saying, like, let's shut, let's shut it down. Let's shut really what down? Do it. Oh, the WTO. He shut down the ministerial and prevent it from happening. And so um, they called for that action to start at 7 a.m. And um, amazingly enough, it was actually successful because we had the place shut down, I think, by like 9.30 in the morning. Um, and then as other groups came and joined um, and added to that action, like it just grew throughout the day. Like the march that started at noon came and the numbers just swelled downtown. So there were four guidelines that were called for just for the 30th because Dan knew that a lot of different groups were going to be downtown on the 30th. Um, like the unions, you know, lots of different nonprofits from Seattle and all around. And so, and lots of, you know, random people, families, children, all these things. So they called for four guidelines for the 30th just to try and and make sure that nobody, nobody's toes were really stepped on, you know, or and that everyone could protest together downtown. So they asked for people um, to use no violence, to bring no weapons or drugs, um, and no property destruction. Right, and so, um, and that was like not to make a judgment on anyone's tactics at all, or to say like this is the right way to do things, but just for that day to say, let's try it, let's all follow these guidelines so that we can all work together, particularly people outside of Dan who are also going to be downtown. Um, and that was the, that's, that's the only time I've seen Dan ask for, you know, certain, certain guidelines. But generally it's, you know, a lot of the people who come to Dan have lots of different strategies and ideas and tactics. And usually that's supported. There was definitely some tension, you know, when we were planning for the 30th about tactics. Because some people feel really strongly that, you know, property destruction is a really important tactic. And some of those people thought it shouldn't be interfered with on the 30th. And then some people thought, well, we should try to ask people not to do that. Other people had more strong opinions, like we need to have peacekeepers to stop, you know, people who are trying to use those tactics. So there was a pretty big debate about that pre-November pre 30th. Um, but that was more just because there had been action guidelines called for. Okay, the fact that it looked like mayhem is good because I think one of the main strategies of Dan that was kind of agreed upon is that there wasn't going to be any centralized group or person that was trying to direct the action. It was um, much more, it was going to be much more effective if we worked um, in, in a structure of affinity groups, which are autonomous groups of people who've come together um, because they want to work together. Of between, you know, it could be as small as five, it could be up to like 20 or more people. Um, so these affinity groups would plan their own actions. And if they needed resources from Dan, like information about where effective places would be to do an action in the, in the downtown area um, or other kinds of information, Dan would try to help provide that. But that that group would plan their own action. And so there were, gosh, I With the main goal. With the main goal being to shut the WTO down and prevent the ministerial from taking place. Um, and so, and that was an agreed upon goal more or less, like officially by Dan. Um, I don't know if individuals within that had other had other goals too, but that was the main goal that was agreed upon by the organization. So, yeah, so there were all these different groups um, from all over the place, you know, like all um, in California, a lot of you know people from Seattle, Olympia, Portland, and from you know some individuals came, and also some smaller groups from all over the country as well, um, and all these groups. Converged, and we actually had a, uh, a convergence, which was kind of like a camp 
for the week before the 30th, and people arrived at different points. It started, I think, on the 20th. Um, and at that camp, there were lots of workshops in nonviolent direct action, in legal issues, in first aid, um, in blockading, which is what we were doing, like blocking the intersections and trying to block entryways to actually prevent people from entering. Um, and also, there were time in the afternoons, there was a lot of time for people to work on different um, areas. Like, there was a street theater group that made amazing. Um, you know, puppets and costumes and banners, you know, actually there was a separate banner group, and worked on street theater pieces. There was a spoken word group um, and uh, kind of a small music group, um, people making drums, you know, just uh, a cheerleader group, like all different kinds of things happening. So we had that week beforehand for people to really come together, for individuals who were alone to find other individuals to become affinity groups. Um, and for people just to like build and make all these amazing things so that we weren't just out there standing on the street holding signs, mm -hmm. but that we were bringing in like lots of creative um, ideas into what we were doing. So I think that week really helped us a lot because since we didn't have a centralized structure of somebody saying, okay, like you five people are gonna be here doing this and you're gonna be there and you're gonna be there. Instead, um, it, yeah, it was all very decentralized but people had a chance to kind of come together and talk about what was happening. And um, one of the things we did at the camp was that we had a spokes council meeting where one representative from each affinity group would come and um, talk together about, okay, what are you, what's your group doing? What's your group doing? You know, trying to coordinate so that we would make sure we were really covering all the area that we needed to cover and that we would really be effective. Um, and so I think that helped. Like, you know, it looked like total chaos, but there was definitely a lot of thought from all the all different folks, you know, to try and make sure that we were really gonna do what we wanted to do, and that we didn't all end up like over here trying to blockade the same intersection or something. Mm -hmm. um, so a lot of planning went into making those actions happen, and a lot of planning in individual affinity groups. What ended up happening was that, um, like, if you think of the convention center, like in the middle of a pie, you know, and then we like split the pie up into, yeah, about 13 slices. Um, and then one thing that we were doing at the Spokes Council meetings was trying to make sure that all of those different slices would be covered. Um, and so that there wasn't one slice that had, you know, seven affinity groups who were all really, like, lots of people really strong and then this slice didn't have anybody. Because if there was even one gap or one way that the delegates could get in, then you know, we would slow them down, but ultimately they would still meet. So we had to make sure that we covered everything. People set up tripods in in the street. What do you mean? Which is like you set up um, like a it's almost like a pyramid shape, and usually there's somebody that can sit up at the top of it, um, and other people can lock themselves to it. What's it made out of? It kind of depends. Usually, like some kind of metal, you know, pipes or something like that'll they'll be able to make into a strong structure. Um, some of those got uh, confiscated immediately that morning, but there was at least one that was successful in being set up, and it's a way to block the intersection that's not easily moved. Um, there was one action that was uh, really incredible. I learned about it earlier. I didn't actually get to see it because I wasn't there, but what they did was they um, set up a mural. This was to block an intersection, so they set up a mural and there were like a few people painting on the mural, and then there was a large ring of about 20 people locked together with those boxes that you mentioned earlier, or the lock boxes, which go over your arm and you can lock inside of it. And so if it's about this long, I'd have my arm in like this, and another person on the other side would have their arm in like this. So you're locked together, but there's something inside of it that you're locked to. And so you can unlock yourself, but um, someone couldn't reach in because the pipe is about the same size as your arm ideally so somebody couldn't reach in and unlock you um, and so they were locked around in a circle to protect the people painting the mural and then there was another circle of people just using their bodies to lock e down to each other around that to protect this mural if people lock down though what that means is that the police can't just physically drag you away like if you and I are locked together arm in arm you know with lots of other people in a circle the police are going to have a harder time than if we were standing there, but eventually they're going to be able to like pull us apart. 
it's going to take a lot of work for them, and then they're going to have to drag us away. So it's a big pain in the butt. But they can do it. But when you're locked down, they can't pull you apart. Like, they have to um, either, you know, use enough tactics that people are forced to unlock, you know, like pepper spraying people in the face, which they do, you know, or using pain compliance holds, like, they'll do this one here and, like, try and lift you up by your chin. Like, they'll do, they'll do whatever they can to, like, try and put you in a lot of pain so that you'll agree to unlock. Um, and then different people, you know, have, will have different thresholds, you know, that they can take before they unlock, and some people won't. And then the only other thing they can do is cut through the piping and usually add a lot of things to that to make it really difficult for them to cut through, like putting duct tape on and other stuff, you know, so that they, it's a pain. And they also, they can't cut your arm off, so they have to be really careful, and it's really dangerous, and they're really hesitant to do that in some cases. So, so did was everyone in that lockdown circle? It was at the same people all day long. Yeah. So these people stayed there all day, which is amazing, you know. And um, I think they may have. Did they move once during the day? They were in one place, and I think they agreed as a group to move to another place in lockdown. There. I'm not totally sure about that. Um, there's one other action that I remember really well. Um, it was really, it was beautiful. I mean, the, one of the great things about these actions is that they had, like, a lot more meaning. You know, it could have just been, like, a bunch of people just went and sat down in the intersection or locked down. But instead, people wanted to bring in other ideas. And so I think that, um, from the way it was described to me, one of the, um, one of the points of that action with the mural was, um, is a way of, you know, talking about the arts and how, they've been really commodified and sold back to us. And it's a way of like reclaiming the street and making your own art in the street. So, I don't know. So I thought that was neat. Um, another action, which was also a lockdown action, was um, that a group built a float that was actually a stage. And within the float, there were places for people to lock in, like they had the tubing inside the float. And so officially, it was part of the procession and looked just like this nice float, you know? and then. Um, it was as the procession which started at Denny Park wound its way through downtown at the right intersection they kind of deployed their action and like people locked into the float and the float took like maybe 20 people to carry it was pretty heavy so people locked down and that was what was used to block the intersection and then people got up on the stage and did, did various kinds of performances and the stage was pretty much an open mic all day long which is really cool you know which is kind of another symbolic action and was like really creative so that was pretty neat and there were a lot of things that happened like that like that's those are just two examples but um yeah and i think that one of the really really great things about about the whole day especially the morning was that there are um you know there were certain actions that have been planned you know maybe for months ahead of time or for a few weeks or for at least a week but then there were also a lot of people who just came and joined in and became part of actions, even though they may have had no intention of doing so, you know? But um, because it was so decentralized, you know, people would just agree, like, okay, you know, we need to block this street because there are delegates coming through. So people would just, like, spontaneously grab each other and bring more people in. And people who had maybe never even heard of the concept of nonviolent direct action were part of this and were learning, like, what is... What, did, what are we doing, you know, and why are we using this tactic, and like, I don't know, I thought that was really amazing, you know, that like hundreds and probably thousands of people became part of blockades and part of civil disobedience who maybe had never intended to do so, but decided that at that moment, like, to be a part of this. So that was pretty cool. And I think that's one of the big ways that it happened. The actions were totally important, but also so were the people who spontaneously became involved. And I think that's how like it all just worked together, like decentralized. In nonviolent training, one thing that we start out talking about is is that a pain? No. Okay. Is um like what are pe different people's definitions and perspectives on violence versus nonviolence? And so we'll talk about what violence means to people, what nonviolence means, and we'll talk about what what are the effective outcomes, you know, of potential effective outcomes of nonviolent strategies and a little bit about the history of nonviolence 
And, um, and then we'll also talk about, okay, well, we can talk about violence and nonviolence, but then for different people, different actions will fall in different places on the spectrum. Like, um, <laughs> Do you want to go outside? Just go down. <laughs> the, there's a little bit more in the nonviolence. Okay, right, go ahead. Maybe. Sorry. No, no, it's okay. Um, and so we'll, we'll just talk about like we'll pick specific actions and then let people to say, okay, is this a violent action or a nonviolent action? And there's such a wide range of opinion about what those things are. You know, for some people, property destruction falls more like midway between violence and nonviolence. For other people. It's not violent at all, but then you know you get into different, like different, all different kinds of levels of intensity, you know. And so we talk about that, and then we actually will do role plays, like, uh, for instance, protesters being confronted by police, and how do you actually, how do you protest and re resist, but non-violently? Like, how do you prevent, how do you pr refrain from escalating a situation, but try and de-escalate and relate to cop, you know, as a person, and try to bring it to that level, um, because you could be nonviolent just by sitting, you know, on the ground and not fighting, but just not cooperating, um, but never even looking at the person, but there's more, I think, which is that you have to, like, push yourself to try and get to the humanity in the person that's confronting you, and that's not for everybody, but I think that that is one thing that could be really effective. Because otherwise, you know, if you don't talk to that person and like try to relate to them as a human being, then they just see you as somebody sitting on the ground, not doing what they're told. <coughs> and that's their choice to see you that way, but like I think that we can push the police to like get out of their role too, as police, if we try and relate to them a little bit. Which I didn't always do on the 30th, actually, because sometimes I was really angry. Um, and I respect people who choose not to do that too, I think that's fine. but. It's one part of a strategy that people can use in nonviolence too. So. Wow. Yeah.